Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven, a show about writing and publishing with your host, J.F. Garrard. Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven, and today we have Jesse Zimmerman. Hello. So hey. Jesse has always lived, worked, and studied in Toronto. Growing up, Jesse enjoyed fiction, particularly speculative fiction and fantasy, anything imaginative. He began writing at a very young age on a DOS computer. Wow, I mean, I still remember those. Um, <laughs> creating short stories and little novellas. In his teens, he was particularly interested in fantasy, having fond memories of playing Dungeons and Dragons in the late 90s at Jane and Finch, the area he grew up in, which led to the creation of the character, The Challenger. Years later, as an adult, Jesse imagined the challenger and began writing stories about him, among other things, having been inspired by the mainstreaming of fantasy fiction and pop culture. The challenger is a semi-comedic character, though prone to brooding like many famous heroes. Jesse put together numerous challenger stories into one self-published book, Our Adventures with the Challenger, which he promotes in many ways, including placing copies in the little free libraries on lawns and porches throughout the greater Toronto area. So welcome, Jesse. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about um, yourself and like what spurred you to suddenly write challenger stories. Right. Okay. First of all, a disclaimer, the DOS computer, that was like old at the time when I was using it. So I was, you know, <laughs> it, was, okay. it was my dad's computer. He had one of those printers that sounds like a donkey when you're printing. Do you remember? Dot that? matrix. Dot matrix printers. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. So we were behind technologically. So, you know, I'm not from that era quite, but I got some of the leftovers from that the DOS era and the old, you know, before we had mouses. Um, but yeah, um, as as for your initial question, what spurred me to to write this? Um, it's well, it's a long story. As we said, I was into fantasy a lot when I was growing up. Um, I stopped being interested for a while in my in my in my university years. I kind of moved on to other topics. Um, Sorry about that, Alterman. I, I moved on to other topics. Um, what made me interested in fantasy again? I'd say probably I'd probably say the mainstreaming of fantasy. Uh, it, of course, we started in the early two thousands with Lord of the Rings movies. That really, really, I knew about Lord of the Rings back when I was in the early nineties. You know, when I was a kid, um, I read the books in high school, and that was before everybody was reading them. You know what I mean? Before the movies <laughs> came out, and then of course. Years later, we got Game of Thrones, which really pushed the mainstreaming of uh, a fantasy. And it's weird growing up, thinking that you're in such a niche, and then by the time you're you're an adult, it's kind of become mainstream. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I'd say the Game of Thrones, as well as um, the Marvel movies, even though they're not quite fantasy, you know, high fantasy that we're that we're talking about, it's still it brought like imaginative fiction out to to a mainstream audience. Um, and made it same with Marvel. I liked Marvel when Marvel comics when I was a kid, but they were still it was still a you know a little niche kind of nerd category for for people. Oh, um, I was more in the DC Vertigo. I like the darker, broodier stuff. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, DC too, of course. Right. Um, Batman's been mainstream for a long time, <laughs> but um, but yeah. The, so I'd say that the mainstreaming of fantasy, especially Game of Thrones, I'd say, and um the 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 wider interest in fantasy kind of and and almost this sort of I will even say when I was younger I had this like I don't want to say a shame but a sort of because you're into this nerdy topic that's considered yeah. nerdy you know what I mean it was almost like yeah I was the only girl in the snowers nails sometimes you know like really? the only girl like looking at comics and I'm with right. my brother right so and that's the thing too is like a lot of things like fantasy a lot of things like comics science fiction have been seen as like male dominated yes, you know, exactly the, the it and is that, true but that's really changed i think in the last like i go i went to a dungeon dragons night pub night like last month and there was it was equal men and women and you know equal gender parity um and you know and they did they did you know pronouns before we started so it's very diverse now so it's very and that sort of like stereotype about it being a, a male thing even though we still get pushback from that you know i don't even want to get into that right now but um <laughs> Yeah, ahead, yeah, so, <laughs> exactly exactly um so what spurred me to make this book um let me uh i have been writing i've been writing i've been writing forever i just haven't published anything until this um but i always wanted to um and i've been working on projects i'm you know the the kind of writer that i start and i never finish a lot 
I think that's common. Um, I think that's 90, 98%. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like one year at university, I'll be learning about a certain topic and I'll write about something similar, but then by next year, there'll be something else and I'll just say, forget it. <laughs> just, what did you study in university? I studied international development studies uh, okay. at, at York. Um, so that's a lot about uh, the disparity in the world between the developed nations and the un underdeveloped world. Um, I, I So I that was... Um, not just that, though. I say I, I informally minored in politics. Informally, I just took a lot of politics courses in general. Um, so yeah, so I was really interested. I was writing a lot of stuff. I was trying to be like Orwellian, right? Or Orwell sort of dystopian stuff when I when I was in my like early to mid twenties. Um, I think that was the year V for Vendetta came out. So you see what I'm saying? I'm very pushed by what's going on at the time. But let me just get back on the topic about this. Book. Yes. Um, yeah. Our, this is a series of short stories. When I say short, I mean about thirty pages and but they're they're short stories in one greater narrative but it's a very loose narrative it's just about an adventure and about different adventures and originally i was writing I, I i started writing my story the very first of them um i started writing it because i wanted it to be there was a an online contest i forget the name of the book and i forget the name of the author but they were looking for stories in a world that they made up and they put these stories online it was about a bunch of elves mostly women elf characters um who are warriors and all this and um yeah the, the, i wrote i wrote the story with that in mind and um i sent it but they didn't take it um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah i know what you mean yeah, yeah i've that, done that but it, but i said you know i got a story out of this i got yeah i got 30 what is it 30 yeah 40 pages well it's different when you write it and when you see it on a book but it was roughly 40 pages and then i i had a story a short story so i said you know I could keep going with this. I can keep keep writing other stories. And I, I ended up writing for a website called schlock.co.uk. It's, it's a website, it's a, a UK-based website, as the name suggests, science fiction, fantasy. Schlock suggests it doesn't take itself too seriously. It knows what it is. And uh, the guy, uh, Gavin, uh, Gavin, he really likes the stories. He, he And so I just kept writing. So I, I wrote a whole bunch of stories. And... And then, it's, and then I found out about, uh, and Gavin actually told me about this, about the KD, KDP uh, Kindle. Amazon, yeah. Amazon. Um, we might all have our reservations about Amazon as a company, but it was an easy way. We don't need to get into that, but it was an easy way to, to get my book out there. So I decided to give it, once I I'd, once I'd finished writing all these stories, I, I said, you know, I could put these all together in a, a small anthology, and, and that's what I did. And... Um, what spurred me on to write it? I guess it was just uh, being back into fantasy. I was writing another fantasy story, um, which we won't get into here because that one's a bigger project. But I've been working on that for like since 2015. And um, this was sort of a, a side project. And it just it was much, much shorter, much. Um, and then I, I had a, a means to publish, self-publish it. And um, yeah, self-publishing, I, I was hesitant to do that at first. Um, we met at an event where you brought resources. I still have the sheet. Uh, you really see it here, but it's uh, various resources about self-publishing as well as traditional publishing. Traditional publishing is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't traditionally published anything aside from small stories online or whatnot. So this was a way to maybe potentially get out there and um, put my uh, my writing out there and, and see where it goes. And this could lead to uh, people noticing me and maybe getting something traditionally published in the future. Um, Did you work with anyone to make it? Any editors, any cover people or anything like that? I I self-edit. Um, I um, I did the editing. My friend, Jasper Davis, I'm going to, of course, I'm going to give him credit. He uh, he did the cover cover here. You uh, He did the cover as well as for every short story, he did an illustration. Uh, this is a personal friend of mine. I've known this guy since I was a teenager. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see. Can't really. Yeah, you can kind of oh, see it there. Wow. He does a lot of line drawings. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's a he's a graphic artist. He's worried about a, uh, AI and and art right now. Um, Who is? Yeah, it's not quite there yet, though. I have to admit. Same with us writers, though, right? It's, it's yeah. Um, but of course, writers, AI writing is based on real writing, just as AI art is based on real art. So you have to have the original artist. Yeah. Just want to quickly show the challenger. This is the title character. 
Oh, wow. That's beautiful artwork. Yeah, I uh, I designed him a long time ago um, when I was a kid. Yeah, um, when I was a teenager, I was about 13, 14. I wrote stories about this character, the Challenger. Mm -hmm. um, he was a ranger. He was kind of a brooding hero. Um, mm -hmm. My stories, even though I was 13, I took them very seriously, even though if I read them now, I probably think they're kind of comedic. But um, but so I, so I, I, I resurrected that character. I wrote about him in these stories. Um, but yeah, my friend did the art. Um, he's my friend, so I just paid him on my own. But because we're friends, it's he's very, re very reliable when working on projects. You got to yes. find people who are reliable, yeah. which is really tough sometimes. But he's one of the people I do rely on, and um, and yeah, he did the he did the artwork. Um, no other help, no nothing else. I edit, I edited. I think I found maybe one typo, but it happens sometimes. A very really? minor one. It happens sometimes, uh, but I edited it. Um, no, nah, that was the only help I got, pretty much. Do you find it challenging to do by yourself? I like your choice of words, challenging. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I. I do a lot of my work, my work by myself in general. I would say that I would say that I I, I do I do a lot of work on my own as it is. Um, the only other step I could think of is editing, really. But I don't know. I I can do that. Mm, you know, I. Um, well, as we talk about AI and stuff, I mean, there's a yeah. lot of programs I think people use. Um, right. Program like Grammarly and the Pro Writing Aid. They're not perfect, but it's a little bit of help. Yeah. I think editing is probably the most expensive part of the book is getting someone to look at it and make yeah. sense. So yeah. Yeah. For for sure, if it was traditional publishing, I think I'd be I'd be taking that step for sure. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, and the traditional, there's the barrier of actually getting in the door. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now yeah. I know after you publish the book, then you it's almost like you have to shut down your writing brain. You have to think of your marketing brain. So yeah. yeah. Um, so what sort of things have you done to promote your book? Um, this is the first podcast I've appeared to talk about it. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, and I, <laughs> I do realize that I do got to do that more in general, be more proactive looking for, um, so I am going to look for other podcasts, any, anyone else who will, who would be happy to give me exposure as, you know, a fellow artist or, or whatnot. Um, and that's the thing. Um, I didn't go to university for marketing or anything. So although I, I have learned sort of informally, um, just through people I know who do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, marketing, I, I've had some paid for ads. I, I am active on social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, uh, which I know I need to get involved in, in more social media as well, especially stuff that appeals to uh, the next generation. Facebook seems so like like something older people use now. You know what I mean? It's kind of become like that. Um, and I don't even want to get started on Twitter. But um, the main thing I've done to market it and to get word out there is I, I uh, on on Amazon KDP you can order authors copies for a, a low price in bulk, and then I I get the uh, yeah I get the copies and then I distribute them in little free libraries. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, these are they're usually in neighborhoods with houses. They put them on their lawn. Looks like a little like informal mailbox or an old school mailbox. Um, usually made of wood. Um, some people like to do them up, uh, but they're just book exchanges, right? You can drop off books. You can pick up books. Um, people of all different ages do this. A lot of young people do it. I see a lot of seniors doing it too. They they uh, you know in their neighborhoods. Um, in my neighborhood too. I'm in I'm in the uh, I'm not far from High Park area. A lot of so there's a lot of uh, a lot of older houses here. A lot of people who do it uh, do the the books. Um, I've donated some to I donated some to the Toronto Reference Library. They have a small shop there, mm. um, and uh, other used books stuff. Sometimes sometimes I'll see a bunch of used a bunch of books in a in a a, a cardboard box on the street, and they'll say please take, and I'll just drop one off. I'll just be like, yeah, sure, it was there, you know. Um, and and yeah, I go back to the uh, little free libraries, and I notice people have taken them. Or so I hope. I hope they take them, and I hope they don't they don't throw them out or anything. And they and um, I've seen some come back after they've been out. So I'm I know people are reading them. Uh, I just it'd be great if some some of them would say nice stuff about it online. Get to get. Oh, it's so hard to get a review. It's like I know. pulling teeth. <laughs> I know. Please write a review. Jasper, my my artist, he went and did a review, which is like, and he even said I'm the artist, and I'm like, thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm the you artist know, and I promote this book. Yeah, yeah, people go and see five stars, one rating, and then it's like, yeah, I'm the artist. I liked it. Um, but he actually read it. So he's not he's not yeah. BSing there. He actually did read it and he liked it. 
um i know this guy for years so he just reads it and he can see me in it you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um but yeah as for marketing um there's you just got to promote it and promote it i made a, a many youtube videos there's a long way to go right um it might take years for anything if, if it ever gets anywhere uh, in terms of you know reaching a wider audience oh, definitely. Uh, so tell me about your youtube videos you've made I made a few YouTube videos. I made one with AI art. I'm thinking about oh, taking that okay. one down. Yeah, I, AI AI art. I, I'm thinking I might. It, it's it's gotten better since I made that video too. So I, I could make a much better version of that. But I made I made um, I made videos where I just reuse images from the book. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a map in here. Every fantasy story's got to have a map, right? If it's world building. Yeah, I have a map in my first book. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah it's what this looks a lot like Middle Earth, right? It's supposed to, it's supposed to, <laughs> but um, so so I reuse images from. I did one that's kind of like Game of Thrones. It's kind of zooming all over the map with some mm -hmm. epic music, you know. So it's um, oh yeah, yeah. So uh, that's what I've got right now. Um, I do on Twitter. I do writers lifts. Are you familiar with writers lifts? No, uh, what is that? They some people say they're more uh, useful than others. They're um. You uh, you call on authors of, of on Twitter to to post their books, oh, okay. post links to their books, and then or or whatever, or and then they they re, you're supposed to retweet it once they people post it. It's called a writers lift. Hashtag writers lift. Um, writers lift. Oh, okay, I have to look yeah. that. Up. So someone will say we want to have a shameless Sunday promotion. Put your <laughs> writers lift. Yeah, they'll actually put yeah. that hashtag shameless promotion. Um, and they'll do one every day of the week. Some some of these users, and they'll just promote and they'll just retweet everybody's books. And I put my first writer's lift out there, and I got a lot of it. I got a lot of likes and a lot of friends. It only worked the first few times, though. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're just reaching an author's audience, sort of. And that's the thing: you're reaching other authors. Yeah. So it's like, not necessarily other readers. True. I'll tell you, as an author, as an author, I don't have time to read as much as I'd like. Just because I'm well, also like I have friends that are scared that they will accidentally copy stuff. So I think they've been reading less because they're like, well, I'm worried I might, as I write, accidentally write out the other guy's ideas, like because it's subconsciously yeah. stuff. So I think there's also that too. But I know, yes, yeah, supposedly authors are supposed to read more, but there's this fear too. Yeah, I would, I would read more to make sure I'm not copying anybody. I don't know, <laughs> like to make sure it's original, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, but I have to say, like, recently I judged um, a literary contest, mm -hmm. so I was reading all these books, and then you sort of realize what you like, what you don't like. And, yeah. You know, sometimes people, their story sounds great on the back, but when you actually open the book to read it, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I can't get through this book. Really? So, yeah. so, yeah, I think before I was like, I have to finish the book, but now I'm like, yeah, I can't do it. And then I just put it down, pick up another one. Yeah, I I remember in grade seven I had a teacher who said if the first if the first like few pages don't grip you just forget about it right so yeah yeah it's, yeah, it's tough it's tough it's uh, most of the time I read is on the subway right um I have a long commute usually at my job so if people who don't have that people who drive yeah, I don't and people who do other things they, I don't I don't know where they can find the time to read it's hard right so yeah and audiobooks are a different beast I somehow I can't get into it like I try but for some reason I just don't enjoy it much. It's not the same. <laughs> I listen to audiobooks at night and then drift to sleep to it and then come back and rewind a little bit yeah. <laughs> so but it's yeah audiobooks aren't quite the same uh, so tell me are you going to continue with the challenger like more stories or are you starting another book I I do I do have another larger project that I've been working on, as I said earlier, for about five, six years. Uh, but I, to answer your question, yeah, I'm actually writing this sequel right now. Not okay. literally right now, but every day I I, I write a little bit more in it. Mm -hmm. um, the tentative title is a, called a prequel with the Challenger. Mm -hmm. So it's a prequel. Everybody likes prequels. Uh, but um, I'm not sure if that's going to stay or not. Uh, by the time this, this recording's uh, out there, it should be out um so yeah I, i'm i am writing about the challenger to answer your question though um and um i might if i we'll see how things go i might just keep doing it just keep writing about this character that was the challenger based on yourself do you think loosely yeah loosely, okay i think um i know when i was a, when i was a teenager or preteen i know that he was 
yeah, I guess he was kind of he was kind of an alter ego or kind of what I wanted to be more mm-hmm. when I was in my 30s. Like I was thinking I want to be this like tougher guy who's like um he's got a good brain, he's got a good good mind, but he's but he's also, you know, he's also a warrior. Um but yeah, I'd say so. I say especially now that I am in my 30s and he's in his 30s. Uh I'd say that he that he um I, I see that some ways. Uh but but um, originally I invented him. Uh, I invented him just to sort of be a brooding hero. You know what I mean? Um, hmm. But he did kind of start out as a nerd. So I think that, <laughs> yeah, I think um, it actually says in the story too, he went to university and everything and had a bad experience. Um, and then he became a brooding ranger. Um, but he, um, and he is a character that people don't don't assume is intelligent. They think he's just like, because they just see the brooding sort of warrior, but he um, he comes from an academic background, so he's, you know, they might assume he's street smart, but he's not book smart, but he's both. So, okay, yeah. kind of reminds me of The Witcher, where people assume he's a thog kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's a lot of characters too. I think yeah. even Batman's kind of like that, right? So, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, here he looks like Kurt Russell from uh, Escape from L.A., Escape from New York. I think that. <laughs> I haven't even seen though. I've seen bits of those movies. I haven't even seen them all the way through, but um, I realized I got my, even when I told uh, Jasper to draw him, I said, make him look like Kurt Russell. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You need something to base it on when you draw. Yeah. Too. But I remember, I remember the Escape from LA movie came out when I was a kid and I think when I was a teenager, and I think that subconsciously might've went there, which mm-hmm. what we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. You can see that sort of. Yeah. Yeah. So, Eye patch. Yep. Yeah, yeah, eye patch, the so shoulder length hair. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, I hope to write a bunch of stories about the challenger. I made him comedic, um, partially because the tone I was writing for. If I told you about, I told you about that elf story that I was writing for. It was kind of comedic fantasy. Um, so I kind of I made him comedic because, for a number of reasons, I just thought that like uh, as a character, it, it's um, I don't know. He's kind of cliche. It's kind of hard to take him too seriously, if that makes sense. Um, I, I made him self-aware. He breaks the fourth wall a lot. Like, he kind of, <laughs> yeah. Okay. He makes okay. references, yeah. So we've been talking a lot about the Challenger. So mm-hmm. we're going to um, play a video that Jesse's put together about the Challenger. So um, we'll start that. And then Jesse's going to do a reading after. I am Flora, daughter of Flora. And this is the tale of an adventure. My twin sister has for years yearned to leave the city walls in a great quest of sorts. As we reach age her wanderlust can no longer be satiated. I am somewhat indifferent, but I tag along. We travel upon the open road that leads far from our home. In a tavern we meet a woodland ranger, who gives his name only as the Challenger. He claims to be neutral and chaotic, a far cry from our youthful idealism, but he seems to know the surrounding wilderness lands. At dawn we are ready to explore the countryside and find a worthy quest. Where will these rustic roads and twisting trails take us? Read within these pages the tale of our adventures with the Challenger. back again with uh, Jesse Zimmerman. So Jesse, can, do you want to talk a little bit um, about what you're going to read and then you can do a bit of reading from your book? Yeah, anyway, so um, as, as we just heard, uh, this is a story of an adventure. We have uh, two characters, Flora and Fauna, uh, two sisters. How did I come up with those names? I, I don't know. Um, but I always actually I always thought those were good names. I always said if I ever had twin girls, I would call them Flora and Fauna. Yeah, that's actually where it came from. Um, it means uh, plants and animals, as we know. Um, that doesn't really have much to do with their characters. I guess Fauna is a little wilder. Um, these are a little bit based on, on my aunts, too. I have uh, I have a pair of aunts. Uh, one of them's always been the more reserved, bookish type, and the other one was more outgoing and, and uh, I'd say, adventurous. Um, she became a nurse, and the more bookish one became a teacher. Um, so I'd, I'd say there's some influence there from them. Um, but yeah, we have two characters, two uh, two. Two, two girls, young women, 
I just say they're of age. We don't really know what that is. Could be a teenager, could be early 20s. They're very young and they're 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 out trying to make their mark on the world. And then they meet uh, a guy in his 30s, guy around my age, um, at a pub, and he agrees to show them around uh because he's had a lot of adventures and he seems to understand the the um he seems to understand the 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 wilderness land, the fantasy world, and um so he agrees to take them babysitting or whatever, and they they go out and they they have many quests. So um okay. Yeah, what I'm going to read is from the second chapter, Lobster's Revenge. Uh, this Ooh. is, yeah, this is a story about a lobster mage who may or may not be based on a real uh, person of influence. Wait a minute, uh, a lobster mage? Yes. So they're a lobster? Well, he's a, he's a giant lobster man. Oh, okay. We don't, really, we don't really say what he is, if he's a mutant or if he's uh he's, um, or if he's a person who's transformed into a lobster, his name is Lobster Man. Okay. And um that's thinking there's probably a Lego minifigure. Probably. I just bought my son a chicken one and a pig one. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. Okay. Um, so they're they're coming off of a last adventure and um they're going on to their next one. Okay. And uh continuing with the challenger. All right. All right. So this one is, yeah, we'll just uh go a few pages in. We'll see. Let me know when when you've had enough and <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll go from here. Good to go. Okay, so this is Lobster's Revenge in our adventures with the Challenger. This morning, we bade farewell to Barpar and Screech. Screech is the giant owl who rescued us from the perilous valley of the hair-necked ones. This mighty bird roosted upon a branch high above the tree that Barpar calls home, the majestic creature having flown down to us from the high from above the foliage when we emerged from Barpar's front door. For three days, we stayed at the tree home of our rescuer, Barpar, twice as long as we'd stayed with Dick Bumpledop. That's from the previous story. The big furred man's stories were entertaining, or at least seemed so with his brew of thick malty beer. Our three-member party endured our latest host songs and tales while we passed along some of Barpar's herbs from the forest. Our party now proceeds our trek to the woodlands of the great northeast. My sister running on ahead of us as usual, a wide ancient road between heavily treed ridges is our first pathway of the day. Here the tall grasses and woodland weeds have reclaimed most of the aged road, leaving only islands of half broken bricks that look alike pebbles in the midst of an overflowing river. Again, fantasy, we always like to describe describe the, uh, the scenery and everything. Anyway, I'll go back to reading. I, I opt to tread on the grasses. Fauna hops along the crumbly bricks, leaping from one to the other, same as she would pass over the metaphorical river that I mentioned above. The challenger stays with me, the 30-something ranger, clearly exhausted, his visible eye having been half closed all morning. It's around midday when we take a rest, seating ourselves along the mossy side of a cracked road, the ground diving downward into a thicket un under our laid out legs. Fauna, my twin, energized as always, refuses to sit, standing near the midpoint of the road, glaring out at the way ahead. After downing half a flask of something watery, the challenger turns to me. I'm hungry, he says, bringing the knapsack Barbar had gifted us off of his back. Our furry rescuer had given us his backpack and filled it with loaves of seedy baked brown bread with cinnamon, salted strips of sirloin, a bushel of giant apples, and a jar of deep orange honey. Barbar had even stitched his name into the gift just so we'd remember him. The ranger licked his lips. Sorry, the ranger licks his lips as he takes out a steak, a piece of steak and dips it into the honey jar. I grab a big dark apple, needing my full hand to clasp it, opening my jaw to take a big bite. When it flies out of from my hands, an arrow shaft emerging in sight as it plunges through the apple, sending it whizzing through the air and sticking against the thick willow trunk that rises from the ditch behind us. Fauna, I shriek, turning to see my sister with a big grin under her bright red cap, her bow in her hands. I'm sorry, sis, just that apple looks so perfect for me, she says. What, red on the outside but full of worms, I snap back, not even sure what I mean. The challenger chuckles, dabs my knuckles with his fist from beside me. The fauna steps over the edge of the ditch, leaping to the bottom to reach the tree. It's because of your reckless attitude why we ended up in the so-called hairneck valley and almost got killed, I snap, as she retrieves the apple from the tree and bites, taking a tiny piece with her small mouth. In truth, I know she is a near-perfect shot. Ah, no worms, she laughs. Three of us eat silently, save the challenger slurping as he gobbles the honeyed steak. When lunch is over, my sister puts on the new backpack and we continue our journey moving eastward to where the trees suddenly stop and we enter an immense golden field. Here the air is exceptionally warm with no breeze to balance things out. As we make our way along a thin trail, I notice that the tall grasses at our sides are mostly dried out. 
Our soldier, sojourn under the canopies had concealed us from the hot sun thus far, but within moments I feel a layer of nasty sweat running down my forehead, my skin feeling warm as I wipe, wipe away the moisture with the back of my hands. I call to Fonda to pass me a flask of water. Wait until we take a break, Flora, she calls back, her sword on her, her hand on her sword's hilt, the blade in the scabbard that she keeps at her belt. The challenger groans and mumbles something. He looks overheated in his jerkin armor, his two belts, and his long greenish brownish cloak. His blade is also kept in a long sheath at his side, slung upon his leather belt. He and my sister both have bows and quivers of arrows on their backs. I'm relieved, at the least, to not have so many things to carry. All I have is my trusty dagger in my pocket. We lost a bunch of item and items back in the valley, including my little scope that Mother gifted me. Ah, I said loudly, thinking about home. I could use a day on the coast or inside Mother's library. This immense library is always cool. There are tunnels that are designed to suck in the air from outside and send it spiraling down long pipes that lead to the chambers, the breeze cooled by tunnels of water that it flows through my on the way. Right now, I imagine myself reading an old book, leaning back, drinking from a cup of icy water as I enjoy the calming silence in one of the gi giant rooms or corridors, the perfect way to spend a hot day in Mother's library. A long hour passes while we make our way through the tall grasses. The landscape, it stays the same. There are mountains and hills in the distance to the north and the northeast, a half a day's trek perhaps, and beyond the field eastward I can see woodlands again. Trees, the challenger shouts as he too notices them. Shade, I cry in agreement. You guys really hate the heat, I fun ask, waiting for us to catch up to her. Typical adventurous grin on her face. A dragonfly buzzes past her. She swaps it but misses. The long buddy bodied bug speeding past her. She charges after it, pulling out her bow as she runs, loading an arrow. The challenger and I share a shrug and take off after her. We run ahead a short distance, coming to a creek, not a metaphorical one this time, with the shore of dry mud. We peer into dark green water, its surface covered in thick peat. I bet it's steeper than it looks, says the challenger, pointing his head hand at the width of the river, which looks two times too wide to leap across. Wait a sec, says Fauna, pulling her back her bowstring. I think I got it. Just as she is about to loose the arrow at the dragonfly that rests upon a particularly long cattail now, a long pinkish thing, a tongue, flings up from beneath the water and snatches it, the arrow. We see it, no, sorry, the dragonfly. We see a pair of olive green lips emerge from the creek. Ew, says Fauna, as a frog that must be as large as a medium-sized dog raises his head above the water, chewing before belching louder than any person I've ever heard. Frogs don't really belch, but the challenger laughs at my side and says, all right then, how to cross. Scanning the far side of the dank creek, I begin to say something when my sister backtracks a few steps before charging and then leaping from the edge of the creek her feet landing nimbly upon the big frog's head before jumping again and flipping in the air, landing perfectly upon the far shore. Such a show-off, mutters the challenger, and he says, I can do that, probably. The frog in the middle of the creek raises its bulbous head, opens its lips, and lets loose its mighty tongue, aiming directly at Fauna's back now. The tongue latches onto the knapsack with all our food. She cries out, falling back, landing on her butt on the dry butt of the shore. The ranger at my side grabs his bow in haste, lining up an arrow just as the knapsack flings off my sister's back splashing green brown water as it lands atop the frog's face and then both sink into the gloopy water the challenger lowers his bow having not bothered to shoot the arrow fauna curses and says that's our food we need to kill it kill that toad i think it's a frog i say and the challenger nods a series of big bubbles rise to the surface of the spot where the knapsack sank another loud belch rings out and then something splashes and shoots out from the water landing beside fauna it's the knapsack fauna sighs loudly in relief grabbing the now slimy bag, forcing it open. Hey, the toad ate all our food, she says. The challenger reloads the arrow. Fauna grabs her bow off her torso and does the same. They both let loose about five arrows each before I yell at them. Stop it, you're wasting them. Kill the toad, my sister cries angrily. Slice his belly, my rager friend agrees. Get our food, yells my sister. Do we really want to eat the food after it's been inside that frog, I ask them. Anyway, so they both stop. My sister continues swearing. I look away sighting a wooden bridge down the creek, cursing a bit myself as I realized if we just looked around when we came to the water, we'd still have our food. So we crossed the bridge soon after, meeting Fauna at the other side before continuing into the woods. What are we going to do, my sister asked, as we get into the shade of the first trees, finding a thin trail to tread upon? I'm hungry already, moans the Shat Challenger, rubbing his abs under his jerkin. You can catch us something like you always do, I tell him. Great Challenger of the Wildlands, they call you, right? He nods, gazing about, taken off down a smaller trail telling us to go ahead only to meet us further down without any food. He tells us he saw a mother deer and a fawn, but thought they were too cute, as well as a few skunks that he was too hesitant to eat lest we bite into its stinky parts. The skilled hunter promises to get us something later. We continue on our way, our quest to have 
another quest proceeding, the forest pathway widening, forking at some points as we keep to the north and the east. I look about the trees and bushes for apples, pears, berries, finding nothing but leaves and buds. At one point, as the three of us are walking side by side, we hear a deep, low grumbling noise. Thinking a ferocious beast is near, we all prepare our weapons, only to realize it's the challenger's belly. I'm beginning to feel hungry myself. Soon we come to a high point, the forest floor having run uphill most of the afternoon. Here there are only a few short trees, this place relatively clear, almost like a clearing. And we can see the treetops ahead and below us where the pathway plunges downward again. A short way away, we see a single pillar of smoke rising from between canopies, a sweet roasting smell accompanying it. Ah, camp, my sister shouts, pointing. And they're cooking something nice, the challenger adds, licking his lips, although I wouldn't count on them sharing. Why not, I ask him. He chuckles a bit. You don't know wandering folks as much as I do, he says. Some have great hospitality, sure, but others would slay you just for asking. We'll see, says my sister. I say we take a small bit of the food, says the ranger, shaking his head. Why risk a fight? I could just go sneak in there. And then I tell him we can't do that. And then my sister agrees. And then she said, I already told you we're a force for good. And then the ranger says, and I told you I'm... Yes, yes, neutral and chaotic, both of us sisters say at once, to which the challenger nods. We descend the path cautiously, our soft boots making barely any noise, the succulent smell getting more intense as we get closer. Fauna points out a pair of prints in the earth and trail, pointed toes looking more like a beast than a man, but clearly the work of two feet rather than four. The challenger says kobolds under his breath and retrieves the sword from his scabbard. I groan. They look too big for those little rat beings, Fauna says. Eventually, as the scent becomes stronger than ever, we hear voices. They are deep, guttural voices. The three of us slink along the narrowing trail, finding ourselves on a ridge overlooking a camp. The fire burns in a clearing down the way, a thick pair of bushes concealing us as we peer down at a pair of two-legged creatures. They resemble the kobolds that we saw back in the valley, furry and rat-like, dressed in red male armor, though they are nearly the size of a person, and their snouts look longer compared to the smaller kobolds we saw days prior. They hold in their hands long, iron-tipped spears, and both of them are facing away from the fire. What are they? I whisper to the challenger as the three of us, oh, what are they? I whisper to the challenger, the three of us huddle in the little space upon the overlooking ridge. He shakes his head, his unpatched eye looking confused. At his hands, his blade is ready while my sister prepares her bow. There's a big slab of gigantic meat on the fire, part of it blackened and crispy. Behind the flames where the larger than usual kobolds are not looking runs a trail beyond a wall of massive tree trunks. No, I say, wanting to be cautious. We can get food somewhere else. The challenger shakes his head again. Let me go, says Fauna. I can grab it. I'm small. No, says the challenger. The challenger has already parted us, though, even though my sister protests, making his way down the ridge toward the trail that leads to the rear of the camp. My sister grunts, pulls back her bow, ready to cover for him. We see him sneaking through the, black, the back trail, his arms sprawled out at his side, each, tape, each step he takes gingerly, gazing at the two kobolds. They stand side by side, leaning slightly against their spears, which they hold before them, upright, still gazing away from him. One of them mutters, hmm, the one on the left. Then he says, I'm starving, I am. Ah, oh, quit your whining, worm, returns the other. Captain says we ain't taking food to eat and the others are back. Those are our orders. The first of them grunts, hey, starving, I am, he shouts. Oh, just a little piece, Gav. Now hey, shut your rat mouth, snaps the second. Is you still a kobold? Or did the master make you a proper alpha board like the rest of us? Stand straight, mate, like master says, lest you be a snivelling cluck. The first one snarls angrily, but says nothing more. The challenger steps on a twig that snaps loudly. I see his face grimace as both kobolds, or alpha bolds as they call themselves, turn about. One thing about the challenger is that he always has a snarky line ready. The ranger sees that he is spotted and straightens his posture, saying boldly, Looking for me, boys? The two creatures grip their spears firmly and run to the challenger side by side. My sister curses. I try to stay calm, tapping my sister's shoulder, noticing a large buzzing wasp nest hanging from a tree above the clearing. My sister sees it, raises her bow slightly. Hey, who are you? Asks the more aggressive of the two, shoving the spear an inch from the challenger's chest. No one, says the ranger, putting both hands up while still clutching his sword. No one? Aye, oh, that be your name then, says the first of them, the snivelling one. Sure, says the ranger. Aye, oh, we've got no one, we does, says the first, quickly sidestepping to get behind the challenger. Uh, quit your blooming snout, says the second. Hey, we's got a prisoner here, a prisoner for master. Oh, he'll make us the first, Alpha Bolds, he will. The first of them grins, curling his rat lips, his front teeth pointed and yellow. The challenger shakes his head, waves a sword about, a, for a split mo about his head for a split moment and then ducks. The second kobold shoves a spear forward, missing the challenger's head by half a foot. 
the end of his spear plunging into the chest of the first kobold behind the ranger. Oi! And the sniveling creature cries out, grabbing the spear shaft in his chest. Oh, I thought we was friends, I did. Fauna shouts, dislodging the nest. Shoot, sorry. Fauna shoots her arrow, dislodging the nest from its branch, causing it to dangle for a moment. Get here, you twit, the surviving kobold guard shouts as his companion falls over. The challenger leaps backwards, dodging the preceding spear thrust. Ow, says the kobold as the wasp nest lands on his head. Ouch, they're stinging me. The challenger sees his chance and he takes it, striking his blade hard against the foe, bringing him down. He cheers. I pat Spawn's shoulder and we both laugh. And then the clearing, and then the clearing our friend stands in erupts with furred bodies, all clad in the red armor as the first two. I count quickly, gasping as I tally nearly a dozen of them. The challenger's one eye goes wild. He looks ready to begin slashing, and I know he can likely still win here, but a great net is flung from one of the kobolds, trapping him instantly. The many furry bodies move in, tie up the net, take a sword, and then clamber on through the woods, grabbing the meat off the fire as they move so he can't even have food, all vanishing as quickly as they came down the trail. My sister and I, we exchange fearful looks. She mouths the words, what do we do? The challenger is alive, but taken by the enemy. Second place to stop. Did we get wow. the answer? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Are you seeing any Tolkien there? Any Lord of the Rings? <laughs> Yeah, like you, it's a very distinct style that you have. Like you've created a world. I think the hardest part in fiction is the world yeah. building. Part yeah. Keeping it like, consistent. Exactly. Um, it's also in, in, in present tense. Mm -hmm. um, Dungeon Dragons is in present tense when people mm -hmm. play it. Um, okay. So it's kind of influenced by that, but it, it gives the feeling of action. Yes. I think more. And um, and I think it makes it, um, because it's slightly comedic, it makes it sort of flow better that way. You know, and it, it's not trying to be super epic. It yes. knows what it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jesse, for yes, uh, coming on the show. And I wish you best of luck in your publishing adventures and writing more adventures. Yes, and I'd like to encourage other people, if you've got a great idea and you tried traditional publishing and it's, we know how hard it is. It takes a lot. Sometimes, you know, you want to get your name out and you know how to market. Um, it's it's a way there's, and it's not just on KDP on Amazon. There's other ways too. Um, and it's a great opportunity. Um, of course, to, to make money in the long run, we got to spend money. I haven't made any money really off this, just a little bit of money, but um, cause we do get, you could do get most of the profits that you make. Um, I've only, we've only sold a few though uh, on Amazon, but um, you know, uh, it's a start. So. Yeah, it's a long game. It's a it long is, game. It is. Yeah. So. Um, I saw, I just want to finish with a quote I saw on Twitter once about writing. Uh, I think it was on a writer's list. Somebody said, your daydream is somebody else's escape. Oh, and very nice. Yeah, I don't remember. I can't attribute it, but I, I got a whole bunch of these Dungeons & Dragons, these fantasy books I read as a preteen, a teenager. I can't tell you how much hours of, of just joy and just escape they've given me, especially growing up. So I hope my book can do the same for other other people well yeah. thank you very much again jesse yeah okay bye for more upcoming episodes of the artsy raven about writing and publishing visit us at jfgarrard.com slash ar podcast a reminder to patreon subscribers that there's bonus content available for every episode on the patreon website if you enjoyed the show you can show your appreciation by buying us some digital coffee the artsy raven is produced by jf garrard the voice in the show's introduction is chris gorman and music is by tim moore Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.